Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Lisa with Grapevine Health, and I'm so excited today. We have Dr. Reagan McDonald Mosley, and she is an OBGYN doctor, but so much more. How are you, Dr. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. You know, it's it's been a um, a rough few months and a rough couple of weeks, but today is Juneteenth, so we're gonna celebrate. Ah, so tell tell us the significance of Juneteenth for those who don't know. Yeah, Juneteenth is a celebration of the end of slavery. And so in a lot of African-American traditions, Black people will celebrate this day um, with communities, with picnics and cookouts and food and get-togethers. Um, so, so today is a day of celebration. Yeah, and I understand that uh, for two years, there, there were a group of slaves in Texas who actually didn't know they were free and they continued enslavement uh, because no one told them they were free. Wow. Pretty profound, huh? <laughs> anyway, so how are you coping during the, the pandemic? How's, how's it going on the work side? It's been challenging from a work perspective, um, you know, working in healthcare, having to balance both keeping our staff safe while we continue to provide essential healthcare services to our communities um, and figuring out new ways to provide that care to minimize exposure to the coronavirus. So we were providing a small amount of telehealth before the COVID pandemic, and now we're providing a large amount of telehealth. And so we had to pivot um, our complete mechanism providing services and make huge sweeping changes to how we operate, changes that we would normally take, you know, weeks or months to make, if not years. And now we're doing those changes in like days to weeks. Um, and so change management principles have been super important. We do a lot of engagement with staff, weekly staff meetings, a lot of training, a lot of reconnecting and closing the loop and chart audits. Um, so it's been challenging, um, but it's also allowed us to come together, right? Um, and to keep each other safe. Um, so we have a motto of, you know, spread love, not the virus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're working really hard to do internally. Yeah, nice. Well, I didn't actually introduce you properly. So do you want to tell people um, what you're doing right now and where are you working? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, as Lisa said, I'm Dr. Reagan McDonald Mosley. I go by Dr. Reagan, similar to Dr. Lisa. Um, so Dr. Reagan's fine. And I am the Chief Medical Officer at Planned Parenthood of Maryland. I'm also the co-director of Dr. Shalon's Maternal Action Project, which is a fairly new nonprofit that's raising awareness about maternal mortality disparities. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I, I'm getting a lot of questions about whether or not pregnant women need to take special precautions during this time. Yeah. What's your advice and what are you seeing? Yeah. So if you don't mind, I'll start with just sort of an overview of what we know about sort of pregnancy and the coronavirus and what we don't know. Mm -hmm. if I say, and then I'll yeah. get my advice from there because I think it's appropriate uh, or important rather to sort of provide the context of my advice. Because the reality mm -hmm. is like, there's a really small amount that, amount that we know and a lot of stuff that we don't know. So I think right. any advice with a grain of salt. Um, and I think so. your mic is going in and out a little bit, just so you Oh, know. I apologize. Let me know if you're having any trouble hearing me. Okay. Um, but yeah, but just to summarize, there's a small amount that we know, a lot mm -hmm. that we don't know. And so I think it's important to take any advice um, in that context of sort of like the sphere of information right now. So what we do know is that um, pregnant patients don't seem to be at a higher risk of getting uh, COVID-19 or having severe complications from COVID-19 if they do get sick compared to non-pregnant people. And that's important because we know that pregnancy in general um, impacts people's immune system. Um, and for the flu, for example, we know that pregnant women usually have a, can have a worse course of the flu compared to non-pregnant people. And so there was some concern before we had a full understanding or more observation about what the impact would be of the coronavirus on pregnant patients. But so far, it does not seem that, um, pregnant, that pregnant patients have a worse course of COVID-19. However, they are just as likely as anyone in the general population to get COVID-19. And if a pregnant person has comorbidities like diabetes or obesity or other things, that can impact the severity of their course with COVID-19. So that's one thing we do know. Um, so it's still important for people to avo avoid exposures. Um, the second thing that we, um, there doesn't seem to be evidence that the coronavirus causes birth defects 
We don't exactly know if mothers can pass the coronavirus to their babies while they're pregnant, while they're in utero. Um, but um, even without knowing that, there does not seem to be any evidence that malformations of birth defects happen. And again, that's important because there are some viruses. Like you may remember a few years ago, there was a huge concern about Zika, the Zika mm -hmm. causing birth defects and microcephaly, small heads, small brains. Um, so we do know that viruses, when they're passed from mother to baby in utero, can cause birth defects. Rubella is another one that historically has caused a lot of problems, but now we vaccinate for it. But so far, it doesn't seem like that's the case with the coronavirus. So those are two things we do know. Nonetheless, the risk of passing the virus to the baby does appear to be low, even though we don't know if that can happen in the uterus or just during the birth process or afterwards from respiratory droplets the same way that everybody else gets it. Um, and then the other thing we know is that a lot of people can have the coronavirus, at least some percentage of people can have the coronavirus and not know. Um, so some hospital systems um, have done research on this and published it, namely Columbia University in the height of the New York City um, pandemic, um, tested all pregnant women who were admitted to the labor and delivery to see if they had the coronavirus. Um, this was a two week period, the um, end of March, beginning of April. And they tested 215 women during that two week period and they found that only 2% of those patients had symptoms and all of those people tested positive for the coronavirus. Oh, okay. And most people didn't have any symptoms. However, of the people that were had symptoms, 13.7% um, were asymptomatic but tested positive. And so what that, were the symptoms? What, how did they present? So the 1.9% of people who had symptoms had fever and cough. Okay, all right. But 13.7% of people tested positive but had no symptoms. Um, now, <laughs> some of those people did develop symptoms before they were discharged from the hospital or after they left, but it does sort of you know, speak to the fact that someone could have the virus, the virus and potentially pass it on to staff or their baby or their family members and not know. So I've had this conversation with a few other doctors about this notion that you can be asymptomatic and um, transmit the virus. My, my concern about, about this is that people may have um, symptoms but not really attribute them to COVID. So for instance, um, I understand there was a woman who was admitted to the hospital here a few weeks ago. I mean, all she had was back pain. So no one was thinking COVID, but because she was, um, she was seen in the emergency room, it's their protocol to test everyone for COVID. And it turns out she was positive. So I'm wondering what proportion or how often do people say, well, I'm not symptomatic because I don't have fever. I don't have cough or shortness of breath. I haven't lost my sense of smell or taste, so I, I am asymptomatic. Any concerns or any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think the actual percentage of people who are asymptomatic but are positive goes in the category of things that we don't know for sure. But we do know the thing, right? So this one study in, at Columbia University in New York City, again, showed that almost 14% of people had no symptoms but were positive, and they were just days away from getting symptoms. Um, there were other studies done, I believe at Yale and a couple of other hospitals, same thing, where they tested all pregnant women admitted to labor and delivery, and their percent positive, um, but asymptomatic was much lower. It was only 3%. So I think what's important to note here is just that, like, if there's a lot of coronavirus in your community, then more than likely there are going to be a lot of people who are positive and don't know, right? Yeah. It really depends on sort of the baseline prevalence of disease in your community. Yeah. So we, we asked people um, to send questions uh, for you. And one of the recurring questions is about if mothers need to be concerned if they're close to delivery and um, should they worry about going to the hospital to deliver? And that's if they really don't go to the hospital, what are their alternatives? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think there's been a lot of concern about going to the hospital in general for, you know, whether it's to have a baby or just to, to go because you have other concerns for routine appointments procedures, or you have an accident and you need to go to the emergency room. Um, so I think it's important for people to know that hospital systems are taking this very seriously. And many hospitals are trying to make sure that they're being very deliberate to separate people who are positive that they know of with the coronavirus and those that they don't. Many hospitals, like you just said, are testing everybody who comes to the emergency room, whether they have symptoms of coronavirus or not, so that they can treat those people appropriately and keep them separate. 
Um, and that whether we're looking at the study from New York that showed almost 14% of people or the studies at, at Yale or other places where it's only 3%, um, you know, the risk of um, being around someone or in the hospital that has the coronavirus is not zero, but it is pretty small. So it's still very safe to go to the hospital. The hospital's mm -hmm. doing a lot of controls, environmental controls, and doing a lot of things to keep people safe there. Um, but I do understand the concern. So I think the important thing is for people to talk to their providers and ask questions about what to expect what their protocols are for identifying people who are positive, both patients and staff, and making sure that they're appropriately separating those people and isolating them. Um, it's also really important to ask about their policies about support people. So you may have seen there was a lot of controversy because at the beginning and the height of the pandemic when there was a lot of fear and uncertainty, many hospitals banned pregnant women for having even one support person in the labor and delivery room with them. That mm -hmm. has changed but that's gonna be something that people wanna to talk to their provider about. Can they bring a support person with them? And if so, what does that look like? Um, most places are allowing it one support person as long as they're healthy and they go through the screening protocols and criteria. Um, and they would have to stay with them the whole time and not leave and come, go back and forth to the hospital. So you'll need to make preparations if you have other children at home to make sure everyone is cared for. Mm -hmm. Um, there are alternatives to delivering in the hospital. There are accredited birth centers. Unfortunately, there aren't that many. And in, if you live in a part of the country, you may not have, that may not be an option for you. Um, but that's something to research um, and is a good option for delivery. And then some women are turning to home deliveries, um, home births with um, midwives, doulas and support people. Um, so that's something else that can be safe. Um, if you're a low risk person, um, but you definitely want to make sure that you have appropriate um, procedures in place and that you've had discussions about when and if uh, transfer to a hospital is necessary. Yeah, so re related to that um, in helping people decide if they're high risk or low risk for developing COVID, um, some of the questions are also about how, how do I know if I'm high risk when I'm, to I'm told as a pregnant woman I'm already high risk for infection. So is this any different or is there a different way people need to be thinking about this? Yeah, so again, most of the data does not suggest that pregnant women are at a higher risk than anyone else from getting the virus or from having mm -hmm. a worse outcome if they do get the virus. So that's the good news because that's not the case with every virus or every infection, right? So that's good. Um, however, the risks are the same for pregnant women. So the people who are most affected are having the worst outcomes with the coronavirus are older people, um, and mostly those are populations greater than 60 or 70 years old. So that in general, mm -hmm. any 60 or 70 year olds having babies, um, but that's the population that's having the worst outcomes when they are infected. And then people who have comorbidities, such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity, those things seem to be linked with worse outcomes with the coronavirus. So if you're a healthy pregnant woman, you're at no higher risk of getting the coronavirus than someone who's not pregnant and you're at no higher risk of having a, a major complication or ending up within the ICU or on a respirator than someone who's not pregnant. Um, but if you are a pregnant person who also has diabetes um, or um, struggles with obesity, then you may be at a higher risk. So that's something that you're gonna wanna talk to your doctor about, what their protocols are for delivery um, and making decisions about how and when you deliver. So let's talk a little bit more about um a healthy pregnancy because I think when you use the word healthy people have different ideas about what's healthy and what's not and some people even refer to you know having extra size on you means you're healthy so how how can people help people make this um, determination about what's considered a healthy pregnancy and what is something or a pregnancy that might be more concerning or that needs more attention yeah that's that's a really great question so I think it's important to note that there are people who can, by sort of medical criteria based on weight and BMI, be considered overweight. BMI, so BMI um, body mass index, which is one of the criteria that we use to sort of measure um, someone's weight compared to their height and a measure of obesity or a healthy weight. And so I think it's really important to, to note that those, uh, that someone can have a BMI that is categorized as overweight or obese and still be very healthy. Right? If you have a high exercise tolerance, if you don't have any indicators of um, insulin um, insensitivity, 
um, or sugar dysregulation or prediabetes or hypertension, um, then the two things do not necessarily go together. Um, but sometimes they do, right? Um, and we do know that when in pregnancy, people who are obese or morbidly obese have an increased risk of complications such as gestational diabetes or pregnancy specifically related to pregnancy. Um, diabetes specifically related to pregnancy. They also have an increased risk of preeclampsia or hypertensive disease in pregnancy. Um, and there's an increased risk for C-section or complications with delivery. So that's important to note. So it's really an individual thing, right? Like if we look at a society basis, there are general risk factors, but for one person, an individual, they can be both overweight by specific criteria and also healthy. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I want to take this um, out of the COVID realm and now just talk about um, pregnancy and um, the chronic health conditions in general. Yeah. Um, because I had a conversation with an OB doctor a few months ago because we were trying to help figure out how to get moms through healthy pregnancies from beginning to end. And one of the things he said was, our challenge is a lot of women come to us and they have these chronic health conditions, like they might have high blood pressure, they might have diabetes, but no one's ever diagnosed it. So mm -hmm. by the time they come in for their first visit, we also have to help them figure out how to address these health conditions as well. And I wonder if you um, have any suggestions uh, for the moms out there who, who are pregnant, but they've never really thought about their own health before they got pregnant and got to yeah. and went to see the doctor. Yeah. So really the ideal time to be thinking about having a healthy pregnancy is before you're pregnant, right? Because the baby and all of the organs form very early on, like within the first couple of weeks, oftentimes before someone even knows they're pregnant. And having um, underlying conditions or being on certain medications um, or substance use, those things can impact a pregnancy very early on and can increase risk for complications and birth defects. So the optimal time to be thinking about a healthy pregnancy actually is before someone's even pregnant, right? You want to make sure that your folic acid intake is adequate, that your baseline health conditions have been identified and have, are under control before you get pregnant. If you have and what is folic acid? Folic acid is an essential vitamin that's really important for the organs to form in a pregnancy. Um, and if someone doesn't have enough folic acid in their diet or has folic acid, that puts them at an increased risk for birth defects. Where can they get folic acid? Folic acid can be found in any routine prenatal vitamin. So if someone is um, thinking about getting pregnant, um, my general recommendation is to take prenatal vitamins even before, um, while you're sort of planning the pregnancy to make sure you have enough folic acid. Um, so ensuring that your, your sort of general health is optimized before you get pregnant is important, including mental health, right? Including exercise, mm -hmm. other things. However, that being said, you know, um, only half of pregnancies are planned. And so many people are in a circumstance where they haven't had the chance to do all of this planning and to optimize their health. And so we, you know, there, we do often diagnose people with medical problems during their pregnancy that were likely there, thyroid conditions, blood, blood pressure issues, diabetes, that were likely there even before they got pregnant, which is why it's a really important time um, to sort of capture our population and make sure that we optimize um, treatment and management for people. And then I think the piece that we're really not good at, right, is after the baby's born, after the woman goes home, making sure that, um, that woman is, continues to be connected to care um, and that their, their health continues to be optimized. We often, after the, the, the baby's born, forget about the woman and their health and move on to taking care of the baby. Um, mm -hmm. So in summary, the time to be thinking about healthy is actually before you get pregnant. There's a lot that can be done during pregnancy to sort of mitigate those things if you do have chronic health problems and they're discovered during your pregnancy. But please make sure that you don't forget about yourself, you know, after the intense um, prenatal care and the weekly visits and all that is over. You need to make sure that you're continuing to care for yourself um, and make sure that you're eating a healthy diet and that your blood pressure is well controlled, your diabetes is well controlled, et cetera. And, and I think this is such great advice and we want to try and get this information to as many 
as many uh, moms as possible or women who are childbearing age thinking about um, becoming pregnant. But as you know, there's a, there's a lot of discussion right now about the disparity we're seeing between outcomes for black mothers and other mothers, whether it's yeah. having challenges during the pregnancy or having a baby that is not as healthy as it could be. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about why we're seeing this because there's so much attention, uh, funding, re other resources being, um, being um, given to this problem or allocated yeah. for this problem, but we're still seeing it over and over. Yeah, so I'm so glad happening? you brought this up. I'm so glad you brought this up, Lisa, because you know the reality is, is that you know, um, many pregnant women and people who have reproductive age do have chronic health problems. Um, and the unfortunate reality is, is that outcomes for pregnancies in terms of preterm delivery and pregnancy complications are often worse for black women compared to white women. Um, and so I think it's really irresponsible to talk about that without talking about um, why that could be, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of always putting the focus on personal responsibility, which is what we've been talking about, right? Eating a healthy diet and exercising and making sure you're going to the doctor. And all of those things are super important. And we have to also recognize that as a society, there are a lot of structures in place and situations in place that make it a lot harder um, for black women and women of color specifically to lead healthy lives, right? So um, when we think in public health terms, we think of these as social determinants of health, right? So like where people live um, and where they educated, uh, whether or not they have access to green space to exercise, whether or not there's increased pollution in their communities. There was an article I think that just came out yesterday that talked about climate change and how increasing temperatures and increasing pollution is having an impact on pregnancies and causing worse outcomes specifically for women of color, right? So this is the context, sort of an uphill battle where it's harder, frankly, for women of color to be healthy in general and to have healthy pregnancies. And so it's irresponsible to sort of put all of the onus on the individual um, without talking about the systems within which we live, the communities within which we live, and how they have been designed, frankly, um, um, for inequity and differential access to healthy living. Yeah, so this reminds me of um, uh, your recent webcast, and I want to bring attention to it. You were interviewed by the Aspen Institute, and you talked about a lot of these issues. And I want to encourage people um, to find that interview. We, we, we can also post it to help people find it. But in, in, in keeping with what you're talking about now, I would love for you to, to talk a little bit more in depth about this idea of structural racism because a lot of times people hear these terms but they don't really understand um, what we're talking about and more importantly they don't understand why it's linked to black women having worse uh, birth outcomes than than white women so can yeah. you school us a little bit on that yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you for the question. So the thing I was just talking about, so I think there are, there are three ways that structural racism severely impacts health and make health. But first, what is it? Can you define it for people who, who can't, people who can't quite understand what, what it means? Yeah, so you can think of structural racism as sort of the systems and institutions and policies that are in place yeah. cause differential access to power and services, right? Um, so the things that we were just talking about are the social determinants of health are caused by differential policies rooted in structural racism, such as redlining, which was a deliberate policy that only allowed black people to buy houses or prohibited them really from buying houses in certain areas and caused a segregation of our cities and communities um, or how, you know, how our schools are funded in terms of property taxes and people who live in high income areas, um, again, which weren't accessible to people and black people. Um, having uh, better educational opportunities because of the schools that they could go to, right? These are all policies that are working as they were designed to work um, to create these inequities, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of the social determinants of health that are impacting the things outside of the medical institution in terms of where people live, where they go to school, where they eat, the pollution in their air, transportation, all of those things impact their ability to lead healthy lives. That's one way that structural racism impacts health. 
The next way that it impacts health is actually just racism from the medical institutions themselves, right? Um, and so oftentimes we will see differential outcomes between black women and white women, let's say for maternal mortality, for example, and say, well, it must just be because black women are more obese or have um, more diabetes or don't get prenatal, good prenatal care. And so we blame the individual, but what we don't look do is look at how the healthcare system itself treats those people differently. And people are starting to do that now. There was a big study recently in, in Louisiana looking at maternal mortalities and finding that over half of the maternal mortalities for black women were preventable. And so that means that there were things done from the healthcare system level that contributed to those bad outcomes, right? Mm. And it's often easier, I would say, and harder for the medical community to take a look at itself and to think about and contemplate and fix ways that we are contributing to the problem. And so we often just point fingers at the woman and blame them, her, which is inappropriate. So the risk factor is not race itself, but racism, right? That's a really important differentiation. And then the last way that structural racism plays a role in health outcomes is a little bit more complicated through something called um, allostatic load or weathering. And you can think of this as a dysregulation of hormones, specifically cortisol, right? Like as human beings, we're evolutionarily designed to have a flight or flight response. And that's important, right? Because if you're running away from an attacker, you want your cortisol to go up so you can get away quickly. Um, and so that's um, something that's meant to keep you safe, but it's only meant to be activated in times of crisis. Uh, but what researchers are finding is that just navigating the world as a person of color in a black or brown body and being subjected to racism, you know, going to your job and being treated differently or going to the grocery store and being followed or being concerned about an interaction with the criminal justice system or being pulled over from a police officer, that those things can cause heightened levels of cortisol on a daily basis, um, which has impacts for your immune system um, and your hormones that can cause an increased risk of um, disease and decrease ability to deal with disease. Um, so that's caused, called weathering or sort of um, advanced or premature aging. And there's a lot of research going into that now and how that operates. But those are sort of like the three main ways that I conceptualize how structural racism um, can cause worse health outcomes for people of color in the United States. Yeah, so if, if we know these things are, are affecting uh, our ability to respond to um, health, you know, health conditions or chronic health conditions, or in this case, in, co in the case of COVID, um, how our body responds to infection. If we know those things, what are some of the solutions to help address or, or reduce the impact of this, this um, phenomenon of structural racism? Yeah. So I'll go backwards from the, the sort of three things that we discussed. So I think, you know, number one is trying to decrease our stress. And so I've been really excited to see that you're leading meditation exercises because that's something um, that has been shown to be um, effective at reducing um, stress, right? But again, we can't put all of the personal responsibility on the individual. So we also next need to fix the systems so that as people are navigating the world in brown or black bodies, they're not being subjected to racism, unequal treatment in their jobs, in their communities, walking down the street. Um, people should be able to run in their communities without having to be worried about being gunned down by someone who doesn't want to see you there um, running as a brown or black person, right? Um, so we need to both um, individually try to reduce our level of stress and as a society set an expectation um, and recreate our social construct um, so that we are not treating people unequally and unfairly, right? And then from an institution level, it's time that the medical institution looks at differential outcomes from patient satisfaction surveys, from, you know, everything, all of the sort of clinical outcomes, maternal mortality, heart attacks, everything. And if you see differences by race and ethnicity, your assumption should not be, well, it's just because Black people and Latinx people and Indigenous people are unhealthy. It is, what are we doing? How is racism playing a role here? Those questions need to be asked and you need to assume that that is happening in your institutions and address them. Um, just last year, there was a study published from um, Brigham and Women's Hospital, I believe in Boston, that looked at differential outcomes from between people of color and white people who were admitted to the hospital with um, congestive heart failure. 
Oh, uh, yes, I saw this, yeah. That's right, yeah. And so previously, you know, people would look at those outcomes and just say, well, black people are unhealthier and they live in unhealthy communities, so it's their fault. But this study actually showed that the, the hospital system itself was admitting fewer of the black and brown people to the specialized cardiac service and more of the white people to the specialized cardiac service where they got more specialized care. So then it's not surprising, right, that their outcomes and readmission rates were different, right? So we have to look at the institutions themselves and um, assume that racism is happening and uh, work to combat that. And then broadly as society, we have to, we have to untangle the policies that lead to unequal access to healthy neighborhoods and healthy schools and healthy environments, right? And so that is a long-term project. And, um, but I'm excited that right now as a nation, I think we're reckoning with racial injustice. I'm very sad at the reasons why we're doing it. Um, but you know, as, as, as black people and people of color navigating this world, there isn't a day that we haven't thought about um, racial injustice. Um, and so it is somewhat hopeful and refreshing that the rest of the world seems to be waking up to this. And it's not just the United States, it's literally the rest of the world. I mean, there are people protesting in Berlin and in Paris and in London um, in solidarity. Um, and so it does feel like there's a renewed focus on, on this issue. Um, and so I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe not in my lifetime, but in my children's lifetime, that this conversation will be a, a historical one and not one of cur current context. Yeah, I'm trying not to be jaded about it and thinking, have we, we haven't had a moment quite like this before, but these issues have come up before. And I'm hoping that this will uh, lead to a different outcome. So um, back to your webinar, there was, a, there was something else you said that I would love to hear you talk a bit more about because, um, there's a nuance around what you're talking about. And I think a lot of people didn't get it. And it's this idea that race is a social construct. Yeah. What the heck does that mean? And you just <laughs> break it down like a kindergartner needs to understand what you're saying. Yeah. I'm so glad that you asked that because we really didn't have the chance to delve, to dive into it adequately on that, um, in the webinar. Um, but race is a social construct. There's nothing biological or scientific about race. Um, there is as much genetic diversity between races as there are within, meaning that if you took a group of people, um, a group of black people from the United States and analyzed their DNA, they would have just as much genetic diversity within that group as they have compared to people um, who live in Europe, right? Um, and so the racial groups that we've sort of categorized people into are not based on science or genetics. They're based on um, the cultural constructs of how we define people. Um, so I'll explain it to you in a different way. Um, my father, both of my parents were black. My father was a very light skinned black man who while he served um, in the armed services and served in Korea, he passed as a white man um, so that he was not subjected to discrimination and could learn a trade. So he learned how to do construction work and he learned to become an electrician wow. while he was in the army. Because if he had been a black man in the army, to use his words, he said, I would have just been peeling potatoes and like cooking for the rest of the soldiers. And I wanted to learn a trade to better my life and come back to the United States and, and have a trade. Um, so same man, same DNA in different contexts um, was treated as a white man versus a black man. I myself um, am a light-skinned Black person. Um, I live in the United States. I consider myself Black. I'm categorized as Black. On almost all circumstances, people sort of read me that way, right? If I were born in South Africa, however, I would be considered colored, which is a total, di total different racial categorization um, than a Black person. If I were born in Brazil, I would probably be considered mixed. And in each of those contexts, I would have different differential access to services, communities, networks, right? Um, because of my race. And it is same person, same DNA, same makeup, but a different cultural context. So race is fully a social construct. Um, and in the United States, we are a very racialized society. And so we put a lot of emphasis on race. Um, and again, the, out, the effects of that and the impacts of that in terms of health comes are pervasive. So then say a bit more then about how 
or, or why it's important for people who work in the healthcare sector, particularly scientists, researchers, healthcare providers, why is it important for them to understand this distinction about race? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the reality is, is that we're sort of battling um, an ahistorical perspective that race is biological. So in, in the medical context, we have been taught that. And, and I don't know if that was your experience, but it was certainly mine. Yeah. We thought that race was real and it was biological in both subtle and very real ways, right? So but meaning if you're this race, then you're more likely to contract this disease or have this outcome, right? Right. And so instead of naming racism, we name race and we blame it on race, which then gives you or intimates that race is real and therefore biological. Um, and so, you know, in medical school, we were constantly taught to like present your patients like 27 year old black male, right? That's like the first line of every single presentation for every patient that you're presenting. And it's as if his blackness is incident to the fact that he's coming in with chest pain. What does that have to do with it, right? And this, this has real downstream effects. In fact, there was a huge study done at the University of Virginia years ago of residents and medical students, so trainees, people who were training to be doctors um, and, and doctors in training. And uh, that survey showed that 40% um, of the white respondents of the survey thought that there were biological differences based on race and that black people felt less pain than white people and they recommended differential treatment regimens for pain treatment um, for black people and white people. So this is not based in reality. It's not based in any scientific um, uh, reality at all. And yet these are very pervasive ideologies that many doctors um, um, carry. Um, and so we really have to do a lot of education about this, that race is a social construct, it's not biological, because we have been in, taught over and over and over again in very subtle and very obvious ways as doctors and as healthcare providers that race is real as in terms of a biological construct. Um, in fact, the Lancet, um, a big medical journal, published an article a month or so ago looking at um, autopsy specimens of the lungs and the um, hearts um, of black people in Louisiana. And the title of the article was like African American lungs and hearts with COVID-19. Um, again, suggesting that there's something unique or different yeah. about the hearts and lungs and the anatomy of black people compared to white people, which is a fallacy. Um, but again, perpetuates this uh, misunderstanding or this misconception that race is biological, um, which is which is very troubling. But again, allows us to sort of blame black people and people of color and indigenous people for their outcomes, rather than acknowledging the systemic ways that we treat them differently. Yeah. So I, you know, we we are definitely in a unique time in which um, leaders across you know almost every sector, leaders are coming out in support of. Uh, black people, social justice, and so on. And I hope it's more than talk. I hope there will be structural change within their organizations. But when you think about the leadership in healthcare, healthcare institutions across this country, whether it's the C-suite of a hospital or the C-suite of an insurance company, Give us your give us your thoughts about what needs to change in mm. those C suites. Because That's a million it's not dollar enough. question. Yeah, it's not enough to say, oh, we, you know, we support you. What has yeah. to happen? Yes. Thank you so much. I know we're way off, we're way off topic from pregnant women and COVID, but you you have such a rich experience and you I know this is an area of interest of yours, and I think people will enjoy um, hearing your thoughts about it. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I do have a lot of thoughts about this, both at the, you know, healthcare system level and the society level. I mean, I think to, to fix the issues, issues that we've been discussing around structural racism and the impact on the healthcare system and in society more broadly, we need to extricate um, racism and um, capitalism from our healthcare system, right? And, and admittedly, by saying that, it's like slightly redundant because in order... <laughs> <laughs> to work, there has to be a lower class and in the United States, which is a highly racialized society, again, that proletariat, that, that lower class tends to be people of color, right? And by design, because the policies were in place to do that. Um, so we need to extricate 
capitalism and racism from our healthcare system, which is not the way we operate right now, right? Like it's a very capitalist system. You do things to people, you get paid. Um, there are very few systems and few models of care where it's the reimbursement is to keep people healthy, right? Our sort of our system is designed to do things to people and that's how you get, how you get money as a business, as a hospital system. So that all needs to be changed. The whole system needs to be blown up and revolutionized and we need to value outcomes in terms of health and keeping people healthy. And the, the keeping people healthy part, that doesn't happen in the hospital, right? That happens in our communities. That's the work that you're doing, Lisa, to keep people healthy in their communities, to show them how to eat healthy, to show them how to exercise. That's, that's not work that happens when you go to the doctor. That's work that happens in the community. So that needs to happen. Um, again, we also need to, to rectify and just realize that like racism is a part of the institution of our nation and uh, it is insane for us to think it's not a part of our healthcare systems. And so we need to look at the differences in outcomes and patient satisfaction scores and everything else. And when those, there are differences by race or ethnicity, explore how racism is playing a role and identify that. And then the last piece that you were alluding to is we absolutely need to fund and involve people of color um, from communities in the solutions, right? There's still very much a hierarchy of um, who is on top, who are the decision makers, and that's perpetuating, frankly, the same level of imperialism and racism that leads to these this systemic um, inequities. So we need to have people at the table, not just at the table, we need to give people their own tables to be creating solutions for mm -hmm. these communities um, to overcome these uh, health inequities. Yeah, amen. So Dr. Reagan, you've been very generous with your time. I want to give you the last word and see if you have any advice for people, whether it's about COVID or uh, the social justice movement that's happening right now or anything else. Yeah, thank you. I mean, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to be here with you today. I could talk to you all day long. Um, I'm really a fan of you and everything that you're doing, and I appreciate um, having the space to talk to you more about this. Um, what I will say from my perspective is that I, I have to remain hopeful, right? Like I've been thinking about these issues about systemic racism for a very long time. Um, and it's become, a, you know, not just a, prof a professional um, passion for me, but a personal one after having lost a dear friend of mine, Dr. Shalon Irving, um, to maternal mortality. Um, and she is, unfortunately, her case was a classic example of the healthcare system not valuing her voice and not listening to her, right? And so um, I, I am at this one, at this moment, um, infuriated, right, that it has come to this point where we need a global pandemic and over 100,000 Americans have died before people are willing to, like, be curious and interested in thinking about and doing research about the ways that structural racism um, is impacting the health of people of color especially black people in our country um, because you know it, black women have been dying um, from pregnancy for a long time and people haven't been paying attention to it so i am in one part in that it has come to this moment for us to be paying attention to it and on the other hand hopeful because finally people are paying attention and finally we're having these conversations and i think real change will happen i don't think it's going to be easy but I do not think that the world is going to return to the way it was before. Um, I think real change is going to come both at a societal level and at a healthcare system level. Um, and uh, just to bring the conversation briefly back to um, pregnancy and, and the age of coronavirus, I just want to reassure people who are pregnant right now that you're going to be okay. But you do need to be very, very vocal and advocate for yourself and ask a lot of questions from your provider both in choosing a provider um, that is going to um, go about taking care of you during your pregnancy, keeping you safe and um, aligned with how you want to deliver. And don't be afraid to ask the tough questions and advocate for yourself. Um, and if you don't get the answers, if you don't feel like you're being listened to, um, then ask to speak to someone else or ask who the patient advocate is in that context. Um, and you can always reach out to Dr. Lisa and I. Thank you so much. That's Dr. Reagan McDonald Mosley. We really appreciate you and all of your advice and the work you're doing, not just during COVID, but always. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. I appreciate you. That's it for today. I'm Dr. Lisa signing off.